which is sometimes worse than staying up. Good to see Dave. Good morning. It's nine o'clock Sunday morning. Welcome to Desert Chapel this morning. And welcome to those that are watching us online. We're glad to have you with us. And please be sure to go to the website and log in and let us know that you're joining us online. Well, the only announcement that I have for this morning is that remember the pastor is starting his Bible study on the history of John Wesley, and that'll begin right after the church service. Uh, you might give him a few minutes because he's a uh, hobble along right now. <laughs> I know. So, so with that, Michael, why don't we prepare our hearts and minds for worship? comfortable standing please do so now and join me in the call for call to worship come let us worship the lord who revives the soul come let us worship the lord come let us worship the lord 
whose precepts have in the heart. Come, let us worship the Lord, and the Lord our God shall bless us. And please remain standing for the hymn, Take My Life and Let It Be, on page 399 of the hymnal. here that I can sit on because it's less painful. <laughs> it's wonderful to see you all this morning. I, I'm glad that uh, the stand-in preachers kept you all coming back. And <laughs> I'm grateful to Anita, who is a, a lay speaker and obviously did a good job. I did watch you on on TV, by the way. You, you were here. You didn't have to. Oh, yeah, it was Ryan I watched. Uh, yes. <laughs> the leg's not the only thing that's going. <laughs> uh, of all the things I've lost, I miss my mind the most. Um, I'm, I'm so thankful that we have so many retired clergy in the congregation, too. I'm thankful for them um, for filling in for me and keeping you all spiritually straight. <laughs> it, it is, you know, when you're, when you're the only pastor, it is quite frightening sometimes, feeling that you've got to be here. But then you realize I've got all these great people who are, well, actually most of them got a lot more experience than I do. Uh, and it's just wonderful to have them here and know that I can rely on them. So I thank you very much. I thank you all for being here throughout my disability, and I'm pretty sure that somewhere down the road I'm going to be away for a little more time while they fix this knee permanently, I hope. Um, so keep the faith. Keep the prayers coming. I, I really appreciate it. I know you've been praying for me, and it, it really is great comfort to know that I have a congregation behind me. Thank you. Now, as we <clears throat> move into a time of prayer, um, one group of people particularly are on my heart. Um, 
and that's the people in the in the Pacific Ocean after that earth under sea earthquake. And did you see the photographs before and after of some of those islands? I mean, there's nothing left. Everything's gone. Of course, when they're living at you know five five feet above sea level, a lot of them. So there's not much. It doesn't take much before the the whole land is overwhelmed with water. That. Can you imagine what that's like to lose everything? Not just your home, but your livelihood, your your crops, every, everything's gone. And you know who's going to be first on the scene to help those people out? UMCOR, um, exactly. United Methodist Committee on Relief. They're always first there, but they're the ones you hear nothing about because it's not politically correct. But uh, any time you can support UMCOR, I, I recommend that you do it. They do a wonderful job. Every, every cent that you donate goes directly to relief. The management and the administrative side of it comes out of apportionments. It does not come out of donations. It's the best charity you can do, donate to, I, I believe. That's my personal feeling. Anyway, we need to remember those people in our prayers and the situation with COVID, well, you, you know, you've all heard that what's going on from the, the TV and the radio. Um, I have my own feelings about some of the things that are being broadcast. I'm not sure it's all exactly what they would have us believe, but pray for those affected, pray for the families of those affected. And, you know, the more I hear about it, the more I realize vaccination is going to help us. I'm not saying it's the be all and end all, but it does help. It really does. And I've heard people recently who passed away from COVID and my first question is, were they vaccinated? And nine times out of 10, the answer is no. So I know there are some people that cannot be vaccinated. Our adopted daughter is one of them. She has this gene which if she has the vaccination, it would probably kill her. And her children are the same. They inherited that gene. Um, there are exceptions like that. But pray that everyone who can will be vaccinated. Do you know what the vaccination rate is in this country right now? 69%. That's all. Places like Israel, some other countries, they're at 95%. So we need to encourage people who can get vaccinated to get vaccinated. For the benefit of all of us. This is not my sermon, but it's getting that way. <laughs> this is prayer time. So let's be in prayer. I'll give you a few moments for your own silent prayers and then we'll continue from there. Almighty God, we thank you for the gift that you have given us, the gift of speaking to you directly, not through some high priest or not through some special person, but directly to you because of the gift that your son Jesus Christ gave us, where we might have access directly to you. And when we don't know how to pray, the Holy Spirit prays for us. Lord, we thank you that you have given us that gift. Now let us pray the prayer that is in the bulletin there. O oh God, our guide and guardian, you have led us apart from the busy world 
into the quiet of your house. Grant us grace to worship you in spirit and in truth. In the holy Enable us to do more perfectly the work to which you have called us, that we may not fear the coming of night when we shall resign into our, your hands the tasks which you have committed to us. Amen. Now let's say together the prayer that Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not from temptation, and deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. The scripture reading this morning is from Luke 4, verses 14 through 21. Then Jesus, filled with the power of the Spirit, returned to Galilee, and a report about him spread through all the surrounding country. He began to teach in their synagogues and was praised by everyone. When he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, he went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day, as was his custom. He stood up to read, and the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was given to him. He unrolled the scroll and found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to let the oppressed go free to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And he rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant, and sat down. The eyes of all in the synagogue were fixed on him. Then he began to say to them, Today this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. Please stand if you are comfortable doing so for the hymn, He Leadeth Me, in the hymnal on page 128. Thank you.
man is sitting on a stool in a long gown, ladies. <coughs> I need to get some hints. <laughs> uh, this is a passage of Scripture where Jesus begins his earthly ministry. He basically has been unheard of for about 17 or 18 years. No one knows what happened after he visited the temple at the age of 12. What happened after that? We really don't know. There are some, believe it or not, there are some Gospels which are not in our Bible, not in our current canon, that have some pretty strange stories in them. If you've ever read any of them, there, there's a story about Jesus beating up on one of his friends. Doesn't sound Jesus, does it, really? And then there's another one about he makes little models of sparrows out of clay and then shouts and they fly away. Really? What does that prove? No. And there are several of these non-canonical books which have some really strange stories in. And you can understand why they didn't get put into the Bible. <laughs> it makes perfect sense. But here we have one of four accounts of Jesus' ministry. And in this particular book, Basically, we don't know anything about what really happened until Jesus is baptized. After the birth, we, we don't hear anything until the baptism by John the Baptist in the River Jordan. By the way, who's, who's been to Israel? Who's been shown the baptismal place just south of the Sea of Galilee? Didn't happen there. <laughs> Pardon? Oh, you've been to the other one too, yeah. It was more likely in, and there's a reason for that, there's more likely that it's near Jericho. For the simple reason it's known that the Jordan in those days was fairly shallow there, two or three feet. And there's another very important thing that happened there. Jesus was baptized at the same place where the Israelites crossed the Jordan into the promised land. Maybe there's a little significance there. But when Jesus was baptized, it's a very significant thing. That's why it's one of the sacraments of the Methodist Church. The Methodist Church only practices two sacraments, baptism, and Holy Communion. Why? Because they're the ones that Jesus participated in. Okay? So that's why the Methodist Church, Mr. Wesley in particular, believed that those two were important. And other denominations are the same. So Jesus begins his ministry in his hometown of Nazareth. Now, those of you that have been to Nazareth, it's a kind of a sprawling place right now. It was about a tenth of that size in Jesus' day. It's pretty small. But it had a synagogue, and that's the important thing. Jesus went to that synagogue on the Sabbath, and it says in the Scripture, as was his practice. He went to the synagogue, and there he, as he was local boy made good, they gave him the scroll to read. Guest preacher. So he reads, he turns to what we now call Isaiah 61, right? Remember, it didn't, it didn't have chapters and verses in those days. You ever wonder why the chapters and verses are a little, sometimes a little strangely concocted? Sometimes the you know, the verse seems like, well, it ought to carry on, or it should have stopped there, and, 
another verse. It was the French again. It was a French guy who did that. He decided where the chapters and verses should be, and some of them, some people said he did it on horseback. And what he was riding on horseback, that explains a lot. Uh, but uh, it was probably also a, no, we won't go into that. Anyway, the, he, Jesus begins to read. Now, when you read scroll, of course, it, it's rolled up. You unroll it, and you roll it, roll one side onto a spindle, and as you unroll the other side. And you usually you start reading at the top of the right-hand column. And, you, of course, you read right to left because it's in Hebrew, and they do things the other way around. So he starts to read at the top of the column, probably, and it happens now to be what we call Isaiah 61. And it's a, a quote that Isaiah, or where Isaiah had written down what God had told him. And when he, he wrote it down, it was a proclamation that this was what the Messiah would say. And the Spirit of the Lord is upon me. And that had significant meaning to Jewish people. And also, when he had finished reading, he paused, rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the synagogue attendant, and then he sat down to preach. Now, that was the common way in those days. When, when the preacher or the teacher, whoever it was, sat down, that was the beginning of class, and everybody else stood up. No, you don't have to stand up, it's all right. <laughs> but that, that was the traditional way. The teacher or preacher sat down, and the students stood. Have you ever been in a, an old synagogue? There are, there, are, there are only a few seats around the side for those who cannot stand. Everyone else stands up. So he's, he sits down and he begins to preach and says, you have heard today the words of Isaiah and here I am to fulfill those words from the greatest prophet. Now you think that didn't stir up some concern? This is a carpenter's son for heaven's sake. This is that strange guy who you know, did some really weird things when he was a child. So now they're struck with this the situation of this young man, who actually, because in those days, at 30, he wasn't a young man, he was middle-aged, quite honestly. Here's this middle-aged man who's now saying that he is God's messenger. He is here to fulfill the world, word of God. Oh. Now, who's that going to upset most? Those who are in charge, those who think they know, those who have what they concede to be the authority. They're the ones that it upsets. So Jesus does, speaks just enough to kind of nudge them, get a reaction out of them. Now, evidently, according to the scriptures, Jesus was well-liked by the ordinary people, if not by the authorities. Because it says in the scripture, all spoke well of him and were amazed at the gracious words he spoke. See, Jesus didn't put people down. He didn't say, listen to me, because I'm, I'm the authority here which is basically what the, the scribes and the Pharisees did. 
I know what I'm talking about. You don't know anything, so you better listen to me. He doesn't say that. He doesn't preach at them. Jesus stirred up some concern amongst the <clears throat> religious authorities, shall we say. Why? Because they were making money out of this thing. You know, the high priest was a... They were, they were making good money out of it. And here comes this ordinary carpenter that nobody's ever heard of, saying he is the one sent by God. Think that didn't cause a few ruffled feathers? Jesus knows the opposition he's going to face. He knows that the people generally will support him and gather around him. But there will be opposition because the Pharisees will stir the people up and try to oppose him. See, this prophecy from Isaiah, the most respected of the prophets, gives him authority. And the Pharisees can't argue with that. You know, Jesus, despite the fact he was a itinerant preacher, went all over the place, all over Israel, what we now call Israel, um, he always made it his practice to go to the synagogue on Sunday. Always. Not just when it was convenient or high days and holidays, but always. You know, and there are people who, you've heard people say, oh, I can worship God anywhere, right? The community of faith meets here. Not on the golf course. Not at the VFW. Not that they don't do a good job, but community of faith meets here. This is where we need to be. I've been fortunate enough to travel all over the world, and I've always tried to go to a church on Sunday. Not always possible, but sometimes I couldn't find one. Um, and I've had some interesting experiences. Well, I've, I went to a church in Israel, a Catholic church as it happened, where the mass was said in French. Now I speak French, but I sure don't understand ecclesiastical French. <laughs> I knew the order of the worship, because it's, it's pretty much similar to any Catholic church. But the language, no way. I've been to churches in um, Singapore, where fortunately most people speak English. <laughs> but it was, it was a little different. Finding a church in France was difficult. Also in Holland, believe it or not. Churches are closing like crazy in Europe. But wherever you go, there is a feeling of being part of a community of faith. And to me, that's very important. And we need to be here or there, wherever there is, on a Sunday morning with a community of Christians. Well, it's true that God can be worshipped anywhere. He wants us to worship him everywhere. Not just in our solitude, or outside, or in our car. I know many prayers are offered up while people are driving. 
sometimes not for the right reason, but um, but there are times for what a friend of mine calls windshield prayers. Prayers while you're driving along, but don't close your eyes. Although sometimes you might want to. <laughs> I've often heard it said I can worship God on the golf course as easily as I can anywhere else. Really? Does God want you to go out there and swipe that little white ball, spend the next 10 minutes looking for it, because you don't know where it went? Probably asking God's help, or at least saying something to God. And... Are you really getting satisfaction looking for that little white ball? If that's your first communication with God on the Sunday morning, I don't think that's good. When we think about it, there's more to church than an hour on Sunday. Church is a community of faith. It's a learning community. It's a place for healing. It's a place of love. And it's a place of learning. Now I know some of you live alone. For whatever reason. But you can come here and be part of a community of faith. And that's what's so important, I believe. Even if you are traveling out of town on your own, but you go to a church, you are part of a community of faith. You belong. Some would say that the church is a storehouse for saints. But I think more correctly, it's a place for teaching and restoration of sinners. If you think everybody in church is good, you're wrong. It's not a storehouse for saints. So what are we to do in God's church? Do we leave here refreshed, ready to face the week ahead of us? Hopefully we can continue to be a church that not only worships together, but serves our community together and tries its very best to live like Jesus. A few years ago, a popular phrase was, what would Jesus do? I changed it. I know what Jesus would do. What am I going to do is the important thing. We are never without God. God made that promise to us. I am with you always, even unto the end. God's always with you. How you choose to allow him to be part of your life is entirely up to you. Remember people saying sometimes, where was God when? Something happened. You know, a lot of people said, well, where was God on 9-11? A lot of people started thinking about that. You know, that was one of the highest attendances in church the, ne the following Sunday. One of the highest attendances for years. People flocked to the churches. And at the time I was serving a church, where was I? Oh, no, I was serving a church in Mesa. And we had a huge congregation that following Sunday. And I thought, wow, this is just like the old days. Then the next Sunday, it's gone way down. And the following Sunday, we're back to where we were three weeks before. It was short-lived. It was renaissance. Where was God when? That question was asked many times after September 11th. And 
One of the people who, who had a very good answer, I thought, was Billy Graham's daughter. I forget her name now, but um, she answered the question by saying, God was there amongst the wreckage, helping the first responders pull people out, carry people down flights of stairs, dig people out of debris. God was there. God was not with the people who crashed the aeroplanes into the buildings. God was there to help pull the people out, to help the first responders. You know, there were first responders there who were on the job for 36 hours straight or more. Who do you think gave them the strength to do that? God was there amongst the disaster and the debris, helping. Sometimes when we ask, where is God, we forget that we have shut him out. Biggest example of that, I think, is in our schools. How many of you remember having uh, uh, some kind of worship service before school in the morning? Anybody? Oh, a few of you went to Christian schools. <laughs> public schools, I should think. yeah. Yeah, I, I attended an ordinary public school and we had assembly, as they called it, every morning. A hymn, a prayer, a Bible reading and a short message from the principal. The whole thing lasted about 10 minutes. But it was there, it was part of what you did. And at the end of term, we didn't have semesters, we had terms. At the end of term, the whole school walked about half a mile to the village church. And we had a worship service three times a year. Now, being a good choir boy, I went along with it, but we went right past my grandmother's house. I could have slipped into my grandmother's house and waited an hour and then come out again, but I didn't, <laughs> honest. <laughs> but, you know, it, it was just one of the, it was part of life. Even when I went into the military, when we had our monthly parades, the order went out, fall out all, all Jews and non-Christians. Then the chaplain would come up and have a short prayer. Fall back in all Jews and non-Christians. And a friend of mine who was a, obviously an atheist says, I said, well, uh, what, what denomination were you raised in? He said, oh, I was mounted Bombay Methodist. <laughs> and I said, really? He said, you can do better than that. I said, if you don't believe, just say you don't believe. But... You know, God has to be invited into our lives. God is not going to say, I'm coming in, like it or not. You have to invite God into your life. And when you do that, he's with you. He's always with you. We did have one problem with our end of term school service. They made us sing a, a song in Latin. And there were only a few people in the school who took Latin. And they were very good about keeping their mouths shut about what it actually meant. But somebody got a hold of a Latin dictionary and told us what the words meant. You may have heard it. It's called Gaudiamo Segitur Juvenes Dum Sumus, is the Latin. You all remember that one, right? And <laughs> I remember it because it was drilled into my brain. They used to make us practice it during music lessons, make sure at least somebody could sing it. Anyway, we went and got a Latin dictionary and figured out that it meant, that not those words, but some of the words in it said, God bless our school, God bless our teachers. And there's a whole bunch of people refused to sing it after that. <laughs> oh, we were a bolshy bunch, we really were. Children don't think too much about things we're taught. 
Even our clergy were not that direct when I was younger. People were left to their own devices when it came to faith. Come to church if you want to. No one except a few Baptist fire and brimstone preachers would say, you know, if you don't believe in God, if you don't come to church, you know, you're, you're doomed. I think it was about 1960s when we were encouraged to invite Jesus into our lives. You remember that? That kind of phase. Invite Jesus into your life. I wish they'd come up with that a long time before because that's what's important is inviting Jesus into our lives. Not how well you can sing, not how well you can remember Bible verses. You know, some of us have a, an almost encyclopedic memory for Bible verses. That's, that's okay, but it's not required. What does the Lord require of you? Old Testament. Anybody remember? To do justice, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with thy God. That's what God requires of us. Say it with me. To do justice, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. Gonna get an amen? amen. Hey, you could all be Baptists. <laughs> You know, God never tires of hearing your voice. Did you know that? He never tires of hearing your voice. If you prayed every minute of every day, God would not tire of it. He loves to hear your voice. He loves for you to communicate with him. And he will communicate with you. Now, if you listen really carefully, you can hear the voice of God. But otherwise, it may just come to you as someone else saying something, even a preacher maybe, who knows. Um, you may hear the word of God from someone else. They might say, I think God wants me to, and then you say, me too. Listen for the word of God in everything that goes on around you. Sometimes on a Sunday morning on my way here, I listen to the radio preachers. There's a couple that I catch sometimes, and it's, it's called Frank and Ernest. I don't know whether that's their name or the name of the program. I never get, because I never get to hear the first five minutes of it. But, you know, they, they have a, a radio ministry, and they, they talk about different subjects. Now, they're obviously... Probably, well, I say obviously, and then I say probably, that's a contradiction, but they sound like evangelical Baptists. But they are, it's really interesting, some of the things they say. One of the things they say is, listen. Listen to people around you. Listen to what's being said. Because very often that might be God talking to you. God loves you. Don't be afraid to love him back. Amen? Amen. If I can get up. <laughs> oh. By the way, I forgot to mention um, this problem I have with my knee. Uh, sometimes I get a sudden pain and <laughs> my wife has now learned to ignore it, but I sometimes yell. <laughs> Suddenly, I'll go, ah! And she said, she used to say, are you all right? Are you all right? I said, yes, I'm all right. It's just nothing you can do. <laughs> but, uh, so if I do that, please, it happens when I'm standing, mostly, so just be aware it's no cause for alarm. Okay. Are you thankful for what God has done for you? Yes. Now is the time to Show your thanks to God in one of the ways, and that is by giving back to him some of the gifts that he's given to you. And Ali's going to sing for us. Okay, will the ushers come forward, please?
Almighty God, accept the gifts we bring. Bless the givers, bless those unable to give. And Lord, we ask that these gifts may be used for your work, both here in this parish, in this country, and throughout the world, so that all may come to know the saving grace of Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. If you would turn to page 12 in the hymnal. Christ our Lord invites to his table all who love him and who earnestly repent of their sins and seek to live in peace with one another Therefore, let us confess our sins before God and one another. Merciful God, we confess that we have not heard thee with our whole heart. We have failed to be an obedient church. We have not done your will. We have broken your law. We have rebelled against your love. We have not loved our neighbors. And we have not heard the cry of the needy. Forgive us, we pray. Free us for joyful obedience. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Hear the good news. Christ died for us while we were yet sinners. That proves God's love for us. In the name of Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. In the name, In the name of Jesus, Jesus Christ, Christ, we are forgiven. Glory to God. Amen. going to have to bear with me a little bit. I'm going to be a little bit slow that doing this this morning, but my main objection, my main object is to try not to fall over. <laughs> if you see me falling, don't be afraid to rush forward. <laughs> Catch me. <coughs> my wife says, yeah, right. <clears throat> like that will happen. Did you know, on that night when Jesus first sat down with his disciples to initiate what we now call Holy Communion, he knew you were going to be here. But God's on my side. I'm okay, Janine. Don't worry. <laughs> He knew that you were going to be here. He really did. And this is for you. He made the point to say you. And it wasn't just a you for the, the few that were gathered with him. It was for you, the universal you. So on that night, <clears throat> at the Passover meal, Jesus took an ordinary piece of bread from the table. And as was tradition, he broke it using the blessing of Barakatama Dadai Arachainam. Blessed are you, O God, who doth cause the earth to bring forth grain that we might have bread. And then at the end of the supper, took the last cup from the table, Elijah's cup, the cup that normally was never drunk from. Because the Jews believed that the only time anyone would ever drink from that cup was when the Messiah was present. 
And Jesus took that cup and blessed it, saying, Blessed are you, O God, who hath caused, caused the earth to bring forth grapes, that we might have wine. And then he gave it to the disciples, and he said, Drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of a new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. There were so many confusing things in that sentence that the disciples probably just didn't get it at that point. It took some time before they realized what had really happened. But he did this, you see, just for you. We are the many, you see, some of the many who Jesus dedicated this to. Let us pray. Almighty God, you have given us this holy feast that we might participate with you and all the company of heaven, that this would be for us a special meal that marks us as followers of the Lord Jesus Christ who gave his all that we might live. Amen. Will the ushers come forward, please, and distribute the elements. There is, there is gluten-free elements in here. I would apologize that the other cups are of the slightly harder to open variety because these days of support of supply chain disruption, you have to get what you can. So we secured these. We'll give you an extra few minutes to unwrap. Take one off the bottom, take it off the bottom, Paul, please. Got it. Thank you. I don't, I don't want to. When you receive the little cup, will you take the end off with the, the bread in it first? Be careful.
behold the body of Christ broken for you. Take and eat. blood of the Lamb poured out for you for the forgiveness of sins. Drink you all of this. Let us pray. Almighty God, you have blessed us with a heavenly meal. Lord, we thank you for all the gifts that you have given us. This meal of remembrance, the love of Jesus Christ, and the love of a community of faith. Lord, keep us in your care this week and always. In the name of Jesus the Christ, who loved us so much, he died for us. Amen. Please stand for our final hymn this morning, number 666, Shalom to you. We may need to do this twice, so be alert. Shalom means not just peace. It means so many other things. It means love. It means part of the family of God. And many other things. You, you can translate it into about 15 different words in Hebrew. And I don't remember all of them. But remember, shalom. 
to you. And don't be afraid to say shalom to, your, to a Christian friend. If they don't know what it is, explain it to them. Um, don't forget the John Wesley class, which will start in about 15 minutes, right behind me in the narthex here. Um, no requirements. You don't need a Bible. The only thing you need is an open mind and a willingness to listen to me drone on for another half hour. <laughs> but I would ask that you go from this place in a spirit of shalom and peace, love, friendship, and be one of God's people in the world. Go in peace. Amen. Amen.